Our next speaker is a cruciverbalist. He's a constructor. He's a builder. He's an author of crossword puzzles. He's a veritable prodigy of puzzles. And he got his first work into the New York Times at the age of 14. So, you should know that the New York Times is the gold standard of crosswords, and as the week wears on, the crosswords in the New York Times get harder and harder. So Monday is the easiest, and Saturday is the hardest, Sunday is the longest, and according to lore, David Steinberg's time for a Monday puzzle was three minutes flat. <laughs> David Steinberg. How are you? Hi, All right, guys, before I get started, can I get a quick show of hands? How many of you have ever solved a crossword? Well, that's quite a lot of you. What is it about these black and white grids with empty squares that we find so compelling? Maybe it's a challenge. Will we be able to fill in every letter? Or perhaps crosswords are something manageable, orderly, and fun in a world that's often none of those things. Although I can't tell you what makes crosswords so appealing to others, I can tell you why and how I got started with them, and all about my puzzling life. I'm 18 now, but I've always been interested in letters and words. My parents tell me I had a favorite letter as a toddler, J. I had a wooden alphabet set and used to carry the J around with me. <laughs> the J had teeth marks on it, so apparently my dog liked it too. In any case, the earliest word memory I have is when my parents introduced me to Scrabble at around age five. When it was my turn, I thought playing two crossing words instead of one would be really cool. I guess that was my first crossword. By fifth grade, I was really into word games, as you can see in this photo of a project I did for my humanities class. I also constructed my first actual crossword that year, once again for that humanities class. By the time I was 12, there was something about filling in all those little blank squares that obsessed me. My parents found a documentary about crosswords, Wordplay, and got it out of the library for all of us to watch. Wordplay had a scene in which master constructor Merle Regal built a puzzle by hand. He made it look so easy. So the next day, I took out a piece of graph paper and decided to build a crossword. The result which included several random three-letter abbreviations, was terrible. But I was proud of it anyway, and decided to submit it to the New York Times. Not surprisingly, crossword editor Will Shorts promptly rejected it, and my next one, and the next. But each time, Will encouraged me to keep trying. Eventually, I decided to leave hand construction to the Merle Regals of this world and start using crossword software. This software helps with filling grids as smoothly as possible. I had originally thought that using it was cheating, but I eventually realized it was just a tool and that almost everybody constructed with it. 17 turned out to be the magic number. Instead of rejecting my 17th submission, Will Shorts asked for a major revision. So I fixed the puzzle and sent it back. A few days later, Will sent me a yes. That was the most exciting moment of my 14-year-old life, and one thing off my bucket list, the puzzle, which you can see here, was published on June 16, 2011. It was a Thursday, which is the most challenging day of the week for themed puzzles in the Times. The theme involved four-letter words like hiss, which can also be read as H is S. When solvers read all these entries that way and made the appropriate letter substitutions, the gibberish in the center of the grid became spot the code. I remember making a mad dash to the nearest Starbucks that day with my parents to pick up copies of the paper and to see if anyone was solving my puzzle. And when I got back, I went online and discovered the crossword blogs. Each day, four major reviews and hundreds of comments from die-hard crossword solvers dissect all aspects of the Times puzzle, the theme, the entries, and the clues. Before the internet, the only feedback a constructor would receive was from the editor and maybe family and friends. Nowadays, solvers just rant on the crossword blogs. I soon discovered that many people care a whole lot about their crossword puzzles, and that some of them really don't appreciate being stumped by a 14-year-old. <laughs> 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 
one anonymous solver went on and on about how my brain simply wasn't developed enough to construct crosswords. <laughs> Another suggested I go make the crossword world a better place by going out and playing in traffic. <laughs> Even though some of the feedback was discouraging, I continued full steam ahead with crossword construction. I knew I still had a lot to learn, so I spent every spare minute studying published grids, refining my word list, and developing my techniques. As of June 2015, I've had 41 crosswords in the New York Times, and nearly 200 total. So I've clearly been slacking off these past four years. <laughs> I've also branched into the world of competitive crossword solving. When I began solving, I couldn't even finish a Monday Times crossword. In fact, I couldn't have solved my own code puzzle if I hadn't constructed it. I kept solving, though, and gradually got better. Now, I can solve a Monday Times crossword in just over two minutes online on a good day, and I rarely have trouble finishing any puzzle, even the Saturday Times puzzle and Newsday's notoriously difficult Saturday Stumper. I attended my first American crossword puzzle tournament in 2012 when I was 15. I was the youngest competitor and placed near the middle of the pack. I couldn't finish most of the puzzles, especially the extra challenging Puzzle 5 that had ants running on diagonals. Don't ask. Each year, tournament director Will Shorts reads off a list of solvers' funniest mistakes, and I had the honor of being on that list the first year. <laughs> In one puzzle, the clue was Harridan, and I had V-I-R blank, blank, blank in the grid. Nowadays, I'd instantly fill in Virago, the correct answer. But at the time, I had no idea what either Harridan or Virago meant. So, as any teenage guy would do, I filled in Virgin. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty embarrassing. This year, I finished 36th out of more than 500 competitors and won first place in the C division. I got to go up to the big boards and solve the final puzzle in front of everybody while wearing noise-canceling headphones, which was kind of scary. Just for kicks, the constructor, the constructor placed the entry flop sweat at one across, which none of the younger solvers, including me, knew. It turns out that a flop sweat is a nervous sweat caused especially by the fear of failing. So I got to experience flop sweat firsthand. <laughs> in addition to constructing and competing, I've also created a huge crossword database over the past four years. When I discovered Xword Info, a site that hosts all the New York Times crosswords published since Will Shorts became editor in 1993, it was love at first sight. On Xword Info, you can analyze puzzles on all sorts of factors, such as the number of black squares or how fresh the vocabulary is. Xword Info even contains special collections of visually interesting puzzles, such as this one by Bruce Haight about dogs. But back in 2011, I noticed that Xword Info didn't have any of the Times crosswords published before Will Shorts became editor. The Times started publishing a crossword in 1942, so this was a lot of missing puzzles, 16,225 to be exact. I'd heard that these early puzzles were boring and poorly constructed, but from the few I'd seen reprinted in books, I knew that wasn't always the case. True, some of these puzzles contained obscurities, but rather than making me grumble, they fascinated me. I've always been obsessed with arcane bits of knowledge. When I was younger, I spent hours poring over the Ripley's Believe It or Not books, so I was super excited at the prospect of unearthing entries that haven't been used in crossword puzzles for as long as I've been alive. Who knew that some guy named Lippershey was the inventor of an early telescope? Who cares, you might say? My response would be, I now know a name that few people in the world have ever heard of. I soon discovered that I was just as captivated by the crosswords published during an era that ended three years before I was born as I was by today's crosswords. This era began even before my parents were born, which made these puzzles very, very old. Sorry, Mom and Dad. <laughs> I wanted to get all the old puzzles onto Xword Info so the complete collection of daily and Sunday Times crosswords would be easily available to anyone. So I decided to see whether finding and then digitizing all the early puzzles would be possible. It turned out that most of the Times crosswords were available as PDF files through a library database, but that they need, but that they need to be, con yeah, but they, they were available as PDF files through a library database, but that they need to be converted into a digital format that Xword Info could use. It, it turned out, 
that every entry would have to, and every clue from every single one of the puzzles would have to be typed into specialized crossword construction software. With, with so many entries and clues per puzzle, and 16,225 puzzles, that would be a lot of typing. <laughs> There's an example of one of the PDF files, by the way. Yes, the crosswords are mixed in with these things called articles, which, for whatever reason, are considered more important. <laughs> but even though it was a lot of typing, I was a young and foolish high school freshman, so I decided to tackle all the puzzles. I started with 1993 and converted all the remaining puzzles from that year that hadn't yet been digitized. By the end of my freshman year, I realized that digitizing all the early puzzles by myself would be very impractical. After all, there was still high school and college and the prospect of getting a job rather than living with my parents for the rest of my life. So I looked for help. I put out a call for volunteer digitizers to a crossword constructor's mailing list. The response was overwhelming. More than 60 people who hail from places as far flung as Canada and India have helped out. And yes, to those of us in the United States, Canada is far flung. <laughs> I gave the enterprise a very creative name, the pre and Puzzle Project, and created a website to serve as its virtual portal. I started writing weekly blog posts containing progress updates and providing modern day perspectives on particularly interesting early puzzles, entries, and clues. So far, I've discovered hundreds of fascinating clues that would never appear in a modern day crossword. Some have been serious, like brand new science for electronics back in the 1950s. Others have been amusing, like obvious answer to traffic problems for magic carpet in the 1960s. And still others are now politically incorrect, like recent gifts to Japan for bombs, a clue from a Times puzzle published during World War II. At this point, all the available puzzles have been digitized, and 40 years have been proofread and are up online for everyone to enjoy. I also started gathering information about early constructors and contacting ones who are still alive to do interviews. I've met many amazing people this way and through my other crossword activities, one of whom was legendary constructor Bernice Gordon. When I first contacted Bernice, she had been constructing puzzles for more than 60 years. She was 99 years old and still building a puzzle a day. So after I interviewed her, I suggested we collaborate together on a puzzle for the Times by email. Collaborating by email was very challenging. We exchanged more than 70 emails and numerous versions of the puzzle and learned that although we had very different crossword construction styles, we had one thing in common, a love of crosswords. Will Shorts ultimately published our puzzle which you can see here, made, made history because of the difference in our ages in the June 26, 2013 New York Times. I was, I, was, I was 16 then, so the difference in our ages was 83 years. Fittingly, the reveal entry for this puzzle was age difference. Half the theme entries added age to common phrases and half removed age. Thus, diet pill became diet pillage, clued as looting of a legislature and instant message became instant mess, clued as what an exploding microwave could make. <laughs> Bernice and I continued corresponding after, after the puzzle was published, and we finally got to meet in person later that year. We became fast friends. For me, Bernice was the grandmother I never really had. We wrote to each other regularly and continued collaborating on puzzles, and I got to see her one final time last year. She was 101 when she passed away in January. Bernice and I probably never would have met, let alone had much to talk about, if not for crosswords. So for me, crosswords have been a bridge to connecting with other people, even across many generations. This has also been true in my work as a crossword editor. I became editor for the Orange County Register Associated Newspapers Crosswords by Chance. A reporter had done an article about me, and I'd mentioned my dream of becoming a crossword editor someday. Much to my delight, the register contacted me not long afterwards, wanting to start up a new weekly crossword feature. I'm still amazed that they put so much power into the hands of a 15-year-old. <laughs> but it all worked out, and submissions started to trickle in, even though the pay rate wasn't nearly as high as for Times Puzzles. At this point, I have plenty of submissions and reject 75% of them, which puts me up there with the rejection rates of many top colleges. <laughs> now, 
before I hand over the stage to speakers who are working on things like medical innovations and scientific breakthroughs, which are obviously much less important than crossword puzzles. <laughs> I'd like to dispel a few of the flattering but false assumptions people make about me when they hear about my puzzling life. The first, and most common, is that I must know everything. That would be really cool, but it's definitely not the case. Over time, I memorize many of the entries that frequently show up in crossword grids, but I really know very little about them. Second, many people assume that I must have aced the vocabulary questions on the SAT. Once again, not true. Much to my dismay, the SAT focuses on words that might actually be useful in real life, <laughs> rather than on the names of African antelopes. <laughs> Finally, Many people have assumed, many friends have assumed that constructing crosswords must make me a hit with the ladies. <laughs> They're absolutely right. Assuming. <laughs> assuming those ladies are at least 30 years older than me. <laughs> Unfortunately, girls my age still prefer varsity athletes to varsity crossword constructors. But if there, if there are any 18-year-old girls in the audience, I look forward to talking to you. <laughs> if you solve crosswords or would like to know more about them, I look forward to talking to you, too. If you fit into both of these categories, we might as well get married today. <laughs> that said, I look forward to talking to the rest of you, too. Thanks for listening. You're a hit. That's well done, David. Of course, uh, David, I can't, I can't resist asking, do you know the other David Steinberg? Do you know there's a comedian, David Steinberg? Yeah, I do. I actually put him into a puzzle once. Did you? Yeah. Yeah, he's a favorite son of Winnipeg and a guy who went off to the States and yeah, did yeah, pretty yeah. well, yeah? He's, so. he's, he was known for irreverent comic sermonettes, as I said in the clue. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a very good description of him. Thank you so much for Thank coming. You. Here. Thank you for having me. That was me. great. You go off of D. <laughs>